food packaging. Is it just for protection or is there more to it? This is what we'll be trying to answer in this webinar. So I am Lucy Geurt, Scientific Project Manager at LC Europe, and I'm delighted and very proud to welcome you today to this webinar. And this webinar is the first one of a series organized by LC Europe. And indeed, at LC Europe, we bring together relevant stakeholders to reach evidence-based consensus on scientific issues of common concern. And how do we achieve this? By doing four things. We foster collaboration between relevant stakeholders from academia, industry, public sector, and civil societies. We identify common existing and emerging challenges in food, nutrition, sustainability, and health. We deliver science-based solutions of the highest quality and integrity. And we communicate and disseminate our scientific output widely. ILSI Europe is also part of the wider ILSI network with 17 branches throughout the world. ILSI is a non-profit worldwide organization whose mission is to provide science that improves human health and well-being and safeguards the environment. I have today the pleasure to moderate this webinar and I'm very happy now to introduce you to our three fantastic speakers of today. First, we'll have Professor Anne Vermeulen, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Ghent University in Belgium in the research group of food microbiology and food preservation, where she is focusing on industrial projects related to food spoilage and food safety. She is also co-leading the service laboratory, supporting more than 75 food companies in their innovations and daily challenges on food safety and stability. Since 2017, she is also a professor at the University of Hasselt in Belgium, teaching on food processing and preservation. Professor Peter Ragard is professor of food packaging technology at the Department of Food Technology, Safety and Health at Ghent University. And he focuses on bioplastics, active and intelligent packaging and barrier materials. One of the key elements in his research is relating different compositions and functionalization of packaging materials with resulting shelf life of food products. Together, they both leading the organization of Pack for Food, which was founded in 2005. Pack for Food aims to stimulate innovation in food packaging, in which the focus in the last years has been shifting to packaging materials in a circular economy. And last but not least, Dr. Thomas Gouda, who is a deputy head of SQTS in Switzerland. After studying food chemistry in Germany, followed by a PhD in the area of veterinary drugs at the Federal Health Service in Berlin, he has been working for an European reference laboratory and for more than 10 years in pharmaceutical and chemical industry in various research and development positions. Since 15 years, he is now working for SQTS responsible for the food and non-food testing laboratories. In addition, He's giving plenty of lectures at several institutions, universities, and he's also chairing LC Europe's Packaging Materials Task Force. Now a few notes about the practical organization of this webinar. So there will be time for some questions after each talk and a general Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So you have the possibility as participants to ask any question you may have during the webinar by using the question box at the right side of your screen. When typing your question, we will be grateful if you could indicate the initials of the speaker to whom your question is addressed to. Please also note that this webinar will be registered and would be available for the participants afterwards. And now it's up to you. So we will be happy for you to indicate your answer to the following poll. You have still 10 seconds left to vote.
Thank you all for voting. Now we see the results of the poll. And now I give the floor to Anne Vermeulen for her presentation. Thank you, Anne. Okay, I hope everybody can see my presentation now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for the nice introduction. Um, so, and the, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to give your talk today for Pack for Food on functionality, convenience, and sustainable pack food packaging. So, the vision of Pack for Food is that we want to improve food packaging. And in our opinion, this can be done by a customized, uh, optimized packaging. And this and is I'm also sorry to stop. I'm sorry to stop it. We don't see your screen, unfortunately. I was afraid so, so, but I didn't got a message to share. No problem, no worries. So at least you are all ensured that we are doing this webinar in live conditions. Okay, and you're the presenter, you can now share your screen, please. Here it is, thank you. Okay. So again, uh, so we will give a presentation on functionality, convenience and sustainability of food packaging. And as I, as I said before, and it's indicated by the cartoon over here, Improved food packaging means that you go for a customized food packaging. And I hope by the end of the presentation, this is even much more clear to you. How do we do that in Pack for Food? So we work closely together with the industry, uh, which is uh, over the whole chain of food packaging on the one hand, and with several research institutes focusing on one of the angles of the triangle underneath. With Pack for Food, we look more from a multidisciplinary view and we look more on the interactions between the different parts of this triangle. Now, what is packaging? For most of the people, packaging is waste. And we are floated by pictures of plastics in the oceans, the plastic soup and all the others. In a cartoon of a Belgian newspaper, there was one a cartoon uh, mentioning that Jesus would be uh, walk easier over the water on the water because it's now full of plastic. But on the other hand, plastics is also a way, or packaging in general, is a way to um, show your product, to distinguish your product from other brands in the market. It's also a way to bring your products in a, in a safe way to your customers. But also there in transport packaging, a lot of optimization can still be done as what is shown in the pictures over here. Now, packaging is also a way to uh, protect the food stuff and to try to reduce food losses. Uh, as you can see that if we protect our food in a better way, uh, so in a more hygienic way, and also now with the COVID-19 crisis, this is for sure one of the uh, items that is still in, in very much actual. Uh, so we can, we can make our products packed in a more hygienic way. And in that sense, we can uh, try to reduce the food losses. So if we look to packaging, we look at from this side. Packaging should be functional, but also convenient. And you still want to uh, sell your product to the customers, so you want to have it as convenient as possible for your customer. But if you make innovations on functionality or on convenience with your packaging, your, the sustainability should always be considered as well. So there is a large interaction between, between those three pillars that we will um, discuss in detail in the common presentation. So first, regarding functionality. A consumer always wants to have delicious and healthy foods. And to achieve that, 
many changes have been uh, performed in the last decades. Food producers use milder preservation technologies, not only sterilization, but also milder preservation technologies. There is a an, an trend to use less additives, so less E numbers on the package. But the customers also, of the consumers also want to have reduction in fat, sugar, and salt content. But of course, these um, factors, sugar and salt content, they're also there to preserve your food. So if you reduce the, the amount of sugar and salt or fat in your product, it might have influence on the product stability. There is also a trend towards more globalization. Everybody wants every food product a whole year long in the market. So that uh, aims for more globalization. And all those trends, they lead to extra challenges on the stability of food products. And because of that, packaging becomes even more important if we want to deal with all these challenges as well. Because of the increased importance of packaging, many new developments have been performed in the last decades as well. For example, more use of multi-layer packaging material. In some instances, this is a combination of different materials, such as paperboard, aluminium, and plastics, or uh, combinations of different layers, huh? so that you have one plastic material, which is made of different layers with every layer each has its own functionality and together they serve for the complete uh, functionality of your food packaging. So we see that there is an increase uh, uh, of the use of plastic as packaging material which comes into direct contact with food. So 30 to 40% of all primary packaging is made of plastics. But this implies a diverse range of different plastics. And we see that there was also a trend towards more light packaging, so thinner packaging, but still you want to preserve the good mechanical properties of your, pack, of your packaging material, which is also easy to seal, uh, which is easy to seal methods and even easy to open afterwards. And it still needs to perform very well towards a high gas and water barrier properties, which is needed, particularly for uh, when the packaging is used for vacuum packaging of or modified atmosphere packaging, which is a trend of, of last decades as well uh, uh, to, to challenge the, um, to tackle the challenges that grows by using less additives and so on. If we look to this table, for example, we see here different um, gas mixtures which can be used in modified atmosphere packaging. If we look closer to sliced cooked ham, for example, this type of food product has a an, um, shelf life of approximately five days when it's packed under air. When we change in our packaging the air by modified atmosphere, for example, a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen, and particularly the absence of oxygen, we can increase the shelf life to around four weeks. But if we use modified atmosphere, we want to be sure that the gas mixture that we bring into the package remain there as long as possible. And therefore, we need packaging material with high barrier capacity and often this is done by the use of multi-layer packaging. As an example, it can be, for example, a um, tray made of PET uh, together with a polyethylene uh, sealing layer, which is combined with a top foil consisting of polyamide, polyethylene and EVOH, where the EVOH is often used as the oxygen barrier material. We could use as an alternative a tray which is only made of PET when we seal it with a layer consisting of a PET combined with an aluminium oxide coating. In that way, we have 
less different materials used and probably this will also be better recyclable and so a better or more sustainable alternative. This will be in-depth discussed in the second part of this presentation. So by using those, those multi-layer packaging material, we have some important new challenges. Huh? The resources that we are using, whether it will be bio-based materials or fossil-based materials, but another very important challenge is how do, will we deal with waste treatment? Huh? So how can we make sure that stories as the plastic soup and others are um, resolved? So next to functionality, of course, you also want to have a very convenient packaging. So many innovations have been done on convenience. And it's like it was shown in the poll, most of you are triggered by an easy opening system or by a reclosable system, uh, or when you give more information on the food product or on the shelf life of the food products. So some of these trends I will highlight in this presentation, of course, due to the time limits. We cannot discuss everything which is on the market, but we pick out a few of uh, the important things happening. Heat resistance is also a trend which is important in that sense that many consumers want to have their package immediately from the shop into the microwave to heat up. It's especially important for ready to eat meals. And there are many uh, possibilities. You can just use a monolayer plastic tray or you can have a combination of cardboard with plastics. And of course, glass is also microwave um, if, or it can also be used in the microwave. It would be even better if the same material could be used in a microwave as well as in a classical oven. And we have seen some trends on that as well, like, for example, the use of fiber-based packaging or the use of crystallized pads, like you can see in that uh, picture. But of course, also there you have to find a way to convince your customer that the plastic can be used in a plastic oven because it's always learned to them that plastic is not uh, cannot be used in a classical oven. So if you want to introduce something new on the market, this asks for some extra um, effort to to um, to pursue your uh, customer. Portion packaging is also one of the convenience trends. Uh, so we are not only talking about one portion, but um, different uh, portions available for each food product. And it's also one of the actions which came out of the EU platform on food uh, losses and food waste as one of the actions that could be made to avoid food uh, losses. I would like to refer to a study which was made in 2015 on the, by the Flemish uh, government together also in collaboration with Pack for Food, where we did some case studies on uh, the fact that wouldn't it be better to use smaller portions. And I, you can just go to the link below if you want to see the whole study, so we cannot go through all the details. But in this graph, there is a kind of a summary. So if you look to the y-axis, you see the extra impact on the climate if we would switch from a reference packaging to an alternative packaging. For example, if I take the pink line, which is for the cooked ham, if we have a package of 400 grams sliced cooked ham, and we would like to switch to two packages of 200 grams, then it's clear that we have an increase on the climate impact because of the extra packaging that we are introducing to the system. However, if we can have a reduction in food losses due to the fact that we are using two separate packages which are packed on the modified atmosphere with a longer shelf life, instead of one, if it, on the moment that you open it, the protective effect of the gas is lost, we can compensate that extra packaging after 6% less uh, reduction um, of or 6% reduction of food losses, which implies that from a package of 400 gram of sliced cooked ham, if you throw away one 
third of one slide, which is a very, very low amount of hemp, you would be more sustainable or more environmental friendly if you would choose for two packages of 200 gram and emptying them completely. So it shows that if we would have more portionized packaging that we can also have a large influence on the environmental impact of food losses. Because we should not forget that the environmental impact of food is much, much higher than the environmental impact of the packaging concept as such. Another trend is the e-commerce, uh, which is very challenging for food because often you have to be able to uh, maintain the cold chain throughout the whole logistic chain and also at the consumer place on the moment that you deliver it there to your consumer. And there also have been some uh, developments on that part, um, but also take into account that when you add extra sensors to monitor, for example, the temperature that you introduce always extra aspects to your packaging system, which might have an influence on the sustainability or recyclability of your whole packaging concept. This is, for example, a um, temperature indicator where if there was temperature abuse of your um, um, packed food, that the barcode cannot be read it anymore by a barcode reader so that your product cannot be sold. Another technique that we see appearing a lot is um, based on near field communication technology, where you allow to uh, add an extra tag in your package to uh, protect it from fraud or from, um, to, so to, to, as an enter counterfeit, counterfeit uh, item. So we see the the trends for a consumer which wants to eat all the time on the go and more snack-based uh, food. And that, of course, challenges a lot towards food packaging as well. So people want to have a package which is heat resistant, but particularly which is easy to open so that you can open it on the go and you don't need extra equipment to open it anymore. That is reclosable and which is available at the portion that he needs it and so to um, that's what the consumer wants to have from a packaging of course all these trends they increase the volumes of packaging material in general but particularly they increase the complexity complexity of the packaging material so all these innovations and those trends they ask for more complex packaging material and this increase in complexity that gives us, again, another very important challenges towards waste processing. Now, how can we be sure that if we do innovations on convenience and functionality, that we still take into account what we will do afterwards with the packaging so that people are not seeing the packaging anymore as waste only, but also as something which is very good for the food product. And of course, we should not forget that um, new innovations, they should comply also with the food legislation. And so if you do, if you uh, have innovations on packaging material, new materials which are introduced on the market, you have to make sure that they are compliant with the legislation. So the migration of different components which might be present or which might be added to the packaging should also be controlled that they are compliant with legislation. So these are for sure some trends which are very linked to uh, sustainability. And so um, this is the second part of the presentation which will be given by my colleague Peter Raghard. But first I assume there is some time to discuss on the items on functionality and convenience which I've presented now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Uh, and indeed, we have some time for uh, a few burning questions. So please, if you have questions, do not hesitate to send them um, via the chat box. Uh, but meantime, uh, I have one question for you, Anne, if you agree. Okay. So, um, 
It has an extended shelf life of the food products by optimizing the packaging concept implies always a reduction in food losses. Oh, that's a very good question and, and it's it's not always, uh, it's very difficult to get good numbers on that and it's still something which, which we are dealing with on research level at the moment because it is indeed not sure that by, by prolonging the shelf life uh, that you automatically make sure that you have less food, um, food, that you have a reduction in food losses. What we see is that it, it's a huge difference on very short shelf life products, and so the, the fresh market. If you can achieve there an increase in shelf life by one day, it can have a huge impact on uh, food losses eh, or the, on the reduction of food loss because they have a very short shelf life. Of course, products with a uh, mid long shelf life, it can be different. So everything which has a shelf life of more than two weeks or more than 10 days, let's say it like that, then the impact of, of achieving an, an extra shelf life of, of a few days will have less effect on the, on the food losses than for the very fresh products. I hope that answers a little yeah. bit the question. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question, I think a sensible one. And the question is, what is the right answer to the poll? <laughs> um, I think there is no right answer, uh, to be honest. Um, I was a little bit surprised that, that, that people think that heat resistant is not that important for packed food um, because consumers like to just take it from the shop and, and put it immediately, uh, especially for ready to eat food, to put it immediately in a microwave or an oven. I think about the lasagna type or, or those things. Um, when many uh, research and trends which are now dealt with is, is for sure easy to open and reclosable. Huh? You see many innovations on reclosable again. Of course, a problem that you have there for the modified atmosphere packed products is that the moment that you open it, you lose the protective effect of the gas anyhow, even if the product is reclosable. But it can, it can still help for the drying out of products, for example, which is also, of course, a kind of spoilage. But mm -hmm. there's not a right answer for sure. Okay, thank you, Anne. So uh, we don't have other questions coming in, so I suggest that we move on to the next speaker, which will be Professor Peter Ragat. But before, we give it up to you, participants, for another poll to answer. So please uh, answer the poll that you have now on your screen. Ten seconds left to answer. Thank you. Okay, so we show. Yeah, so now you see the, the results of the poll. So thank you very much for participating. So Peter, I hope you take note of these results. And now the floor is uh, um, is for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, I, I must say I did not see the results yet. Okay. So that no worries. We go back. So do you see the results on your screen, Peter, yes. or not yet? Yes, okay. Thank perfect. You very much. All right. Okay. Good. So you know the presenter, great. So I can, I hope that you can see the slides. Yes, it seems perfectly fine. All right, so uh, also from my side, a very good day to all of you. 
So uh, I will continue the presentation with talking about the sustainability of food packaging. And um, as was also true for the previous poll, also in this poll, there are in fact no good answers. So uh, we have seen that um, multiple, and uh, in, in for the multiple possibilities, uh, people have voted. Um, and uh, before going into detail on the poll, uh, I can already tell you that most of the terms that we have seen in the poll will also be discussed in this presentation. And for sure, recyclability and closed loop will be very important uh, aspects in this uh, matter. So uh, when talking about sustainability, we should in fact also talk about circular economy. Um, and in relation to that, I would like to go back a few years in time where there was a very nice report of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation specifically devoted on plastics. Uh, and as we have seen in the previous uh, part of the presentation, plastics are a material which are used a lot for food packaging, about uh, 35 to 40 percent. And um, this report stated that plastics in general, uh, three key issues need to be um, implemented or need to be addressed. First of all, we need to have, uh, that you see on number one, we need to have more reusing and especially also more recycling of plastics. Secondly, we need to drastically reduce the leakage of plastics into the environment. And thirdly, we should decouple plastics from fossil feedstocks. So, in fact, uh, investing more into bio-based plastics. Uh, if we look to the EU plastic strategy, with, which was implemented a few years later, we can see, in fact, this, a little bit the same topics coming up. And indeed, recycling is a key issue for plastics, and for sure, it is also a key issue for plastic food packaging. What you also see there is another uh, important measure being the curbing of plastic waste. And in fact, this one has already been implemented by the so-called single-use plastics legislation, which was implemented last or, or which was voted last year by the European Commission, and which, which is giving a list of measures that should be taken to reduce the impact of certain plastics on the environment. Now, another very important aspect in this EU plastic strategy is a very ambitious goal toward recyclability. Namely, all plastic packaging should be either recyclable or reusable by 2030. Now, as we have seen in the previous presentation of Anne, um, this is quite ambitious because a lot of food packaging at this moment is still multi-layer uh, because it needs to have a very good gas and or water bed. So industry and also academic institutes are now putting a lot of efforts to make sure that the packaging configuration is changed in such a way that this target, this ambitious target, can be reached. It's not because a material is recyclable that it will also be recycled. And also for that recycling, there is a target. Eh? By 2025, more than 50% of the plastic packaging waste should be recycled. Yes. Um, another important thing as well, and this is this is uh, in the last sentence of this slide, alternative feedstocks for plastic production should be used where, and this is an important uh, condition, where uh, it can be shown that these are more sustainable compared to the non-renewable, meaning the crude oil based alternatives. During uh, this part of the presentation, I would like to give you three key messages that you have to take into account in our opinion uh, when you are talking about sustainability and food packaging. And the first one is already a very important one. Um, you should always uh, consider both the food product and the package together when you talk about sustainability. Um, because, as we have seen in previous presentation, packaging can have a huge impact on the shelf life of food products. Um, also, something that already was tackled a little bit previously is the energy impact of the packaging compared to the energy impact of the whole food chain. There we see that uh, more than half of it, or about half of energy impact is coming from the food production itself. About one third is coming from the 
consumption phase, so the phase at the consumer's house being storage and preparing of the food. And in fact, only 6.5% is coming from the primary packaging. So um, although the energy impact is not that high, it has a very huge impact on the shelf life. So whenever you want to change to another packaging configuration, it, it should not be uh, that by doing that, by changing the packaging, that you, re that you have a significant reduction in shelf life. That should always be avoided. A second key message is to go for packaging optimization, which is in fact a responsibility for all the stakeholders in the packaging chain. So, and uh, packaging producers and food producers and so on. Also supported by, for example, federations and the government. This is closely related to eco-design. So eco-design, this slide will give you five actions that you can do either alone or in combination to make your packaging more sustainable. For example, you can remove some unnecessary packaging components. Like, for example, in certain cases, you can maybe reduce or remove the shrink sleeve around a bottle or around another type of packaging. Secondly, in terms of a reduction, you could reduce the thickness. Now, a very important remark on that, assume that you are already using a monolayer material, but you say, I want to reduce the thickness so I have lesser weight. Yeah? Um, but then, for example, the mechanical properties become endangered and you have to switch to a multi-layer system in order to have the same mechanical properties. That is, of course, not the, not the goal, because then you're going from a good recyclable material to a less good recyclable material. So you should be, um, you should not go too much down into thickness. And the same remark a little bit for foam structures, although they are very good in light weighing, uh, a lot of sorting in uh, companies that are sorting the different waste fractions, they are working on the basis of density. Now, by foaming, you are changing the density and then maybe some materials will end up in the wrong waste stream. A third important aspect is the aspect of reusing. Think, for example, about reusable PET bottles that we see in different countries. A fourth one is to uh, go for recycling. And this is, in fact, two separate things. First of all, use more recyclable materials. So try to use as much as possible packaging materials which can easily be recycled the second part in this topic on recycling is also to use recycled content for example uh, the usage of a certain amount of recycled pet and pet bottles which is already in fact described in the single use plastics legislation the last category here is renewable so try to use uh, renewable resources where, where it is uh, relevant to do so. Uh, we have two categories there. The first one, for example, are the fiber-based ones. So, for example, paper and cardboard or bagassen. Uh, but another one are bioplastics, at least the bio-based plastics. And um, to affect uh go a little bit more into detail on bioplastic i have added one slide because uh, sometimes uh or maybe often there is a confusion what a bioplastic is now, at this moment the current state of the definition of bioplastics says that you have to take into account the resources as well as the end of life so here you see the complete overview all the possible combinations and you see that the first three belong to or are referred to as bioplastics so this includes both the ones that are bio-based and compostable like for like for example polylactic acids or for example um, phb polyhydroxybutyrates but these also include as well uh, materials which are not bio-based, so still from crude oil, but compostable. Here you have a nice example, the biodegradable coffee capsules. But also the other way around, materials which are bio-based, but not compostable, like for example, bio-PET or bio-PE, yeah, 
uh, used here as an inner and outer coating on cardboard, the bio PE, for example, produced from sugarcane. Now, what is also interesting to see is that at this moment, the latest data say that uh, about 2.1 million tons of bioplastics are produced in, uh, this is the latest number, so this was produced in 2019. Now, if we go to the last row of this table being the crude oil-based plastics, um, then you see the huge difference in production volume. So here we talk about 350 million tons. And this, of course, has a huge impact on the recyclability options of bioplastics because uh, recycling is only economically efficient if you have enough material that can be collected. A very interesting uh, or one of the very interesting projects uh, because at this moment a lot of projects are going on on upscaling bioplastics and one of them is called GLOPAC where Pack for Food is one of the partners. It's an H22 project focusing on PHBV yeah, which is closely related to, to PHB. Um, the interesting part is it's as a resource agro-food residues are used and it also combines it with active components as well as with intelligent components. If you want to know more information about it, just enter this uh, YouTube channel where you can see the complete story of Glopak. Okay, so now how can we do packaging optimization in practice? First of all, we can use that eco-design uh, matrix. Secondly, and also very important, try to use as much as possible monomaterial solutions, either plastics or paper, or metal or glass, but try to minimize the combination of the, all, all those materials because they can give challenges towards recycling. A trend that we see when we specifically look to plastics is that more and more there is a focus on only three materials, being the polyolefins, polyethylene, polypropylene, and being PET. So PE and PP mostly for flexible packaging and PET, let's say, mostly for rigid plastic packaging. How can you apply them? You can apply them either in a single layer, so in a mono layer, or as a coated material. So uh, this one was already shown by Anne in the example of the alternative for the packaging of cooked meat. So PET, Alox PET, but another example is PP, Seox PP. Um, both of these inner or these middle layers, yeah, these are transparent layers, yes, and they are um, very thin. Maybe to talk here about 0.1 micrometer. So, uh, in that sense, it is uh, considered to be recyclable. And there are also some projects running. And in fact, Pack for Food is at this moment preparing a project proposal uh, to, in fact, uh, investigate more thoroughly if indeed these materials are good uh, in, in recycling. What we also see is with the conventional plastics, like for example EVOH, which is indeed a very important gas barrier, um, maybe there is a maximum limit uh, that is tolerated uh, in recycling streams. So this is also something under investigation at this moment. The final key message I would like to share with you is that recycling is not in fact the only word that matters when we talk about end of life. If you want to recycle, you need to have collection, you need to have sorting, and you, have to, you need to have recycling. With regard to the collection, there are also some huge challenges to overcome. And the very important one is that we need as fast as possible to go to a worldwide collection of separate um, waste streams. This is very important, and there the role of policy is also very important. But on the same, at the same time, in fact, we also need maybe also to re-educate the consumers that packaging does not belong in the environment. It's also a critical factor. With regard to sorting, we see that there is a broader range of sorting um, equipment coming on the market. Uh, there is also a lot of research on sorting installations. And just to give you one example, was a very interesting project called the Holy Grail project, which was coordinated uh, by Procter & Gamble together with many other companies 
And uh, in this project, the integration of a unique code in packaging materials was invested. For example, the, uh, to include digital watermarks in the artwork on plastics. To give you an example, if we see this uh, by the naked eye, then by applying digital watermarks, a camera in a sorting facility will see this. Yeah. So even if this package would be cut into small pieces, for example, by a consumer, then still even then, it would be uh, detectable by the cameras, first of all. And secondly, you could, for each type of multilayer, you could have a different unique code so that the separation is happening more efficient. Last, but certainly not least, the quality of the recycling process itself is also very important. I will not go a lot in, into detail on that, but there are three key issues. So first of all, the degree of decontamination that you have to reach to be able to use the recycled material back into, uh, for example, new food contact materials. Secondly, which is also important, eh? mechanical recycling exists already a long time, but now we see more and more projects and already also pilot scale operations for chemical recycling, where you in fact chemically change the structure of the, of the plastics eh? to, for example, to go from the polymer to the monomer and then again make new polymers out of it. And eh, on, at the same time, remove all the contaminants. The third important aspect is are we going for a closed loop or are we going for an open loop? Closed loop means, for example, from a PET bottle, you go back to a PET bottle. Open loop means you go to another uh, application. For example, from packaging, you go to a component, for example, for automotive applications. Uh, well, what is very interesting to see nowadays is that a lot of organizations and, and initiatives, which you can see here on the slide, are really working Part on quality of recycling processes, certificate of recycling processes, making classes, what is recyclable and what not. So uh, we are at this moment really um, at, I can say, really at an accelerated speed towards uh, more recycling and more recycled materials. But on the same side, we should also be aware of two important aspects. On the one hand, the food safety of recycled materials. We know that recycled PET is already allowed to be used for food contact materials, but what, for example, with recycled polyethylene and recycled polypropylene? And secondly, what about the environmental impact of all these different recycling strategies? For example, between chemical and mechanical recycling. So, in conclusion uh, of this presentation, um, Anne and me summed up, in fact, uh, from our point of view, challenges in uh, eco-design in relation to food safety. So, I will, I will repeat again the slide with the matrix on eco-design, and I will give some, let's say, some considerations or some thoughts about these actions. For example, if you want to remove certain packaging components or you want to reduce the thickness, um, you should be uh, aware that maybe some of those layers that are initially in the packaging are needed to act as a functional barrier against uh, unacceptable migration, for example, for a certain ink component. So if you reduce uh, or even remove uh, uh, the certain layer, it can have an effect um, on the functional barrier of a material. In the case of reusing, it's very important that uh, during uh, multiple reuse phases, uh, certain components from the food products can be sorbed into the material and then in an other stage, in a, in a reuse stage, can migrate again to the food product. Plus, hygienic factors also play a crucial role. You should have a very efficient washing procedure to make sure that by reusing, you don't uh, contaminate your, your, your packaging material and, uh, and, and, in fact, give the contamination to the consumers. With regard to recycling, there the origin on the one hand and the contamination level on the other hand of food contact materials is a very important uh, aspect. In that sense, we would like to emphasize uh, on the intrinsic 
differences between PET on the one hand and polyolefins on the other hand. Because polyethylene and polypropylene intrinsically, they are more susceptible to absorb components. So there probably decontamination will be more challenging compared to PET. And another important aspect, of course, eh, what is already known for, for a couple of years or many years, in fact, is the possible presence of mineral oils in recycled cardboard. And finally, with regard to renewability, there are also some aspects to be taken into account. For example, a fiber-based packaging does not have gas and or water barrier. To uh, give these barrier properties to the fiber-based packaging, you need, for example, to use a special type of coating on the one hand, or you have to add additives on the other hand. Besides the fact that they, this can hamper the recyclability, this could maybe also have an impact on, the, on, on certain uh, migration. And lastly, uh, bioplastics made from waste streams, um, probably, or it, it's possible uh, that some contaminants which are present in the waste stream, uh, in the end, end up in the bioplastic material itself. So this is also a challenge to be taken into account. So by saying that, I think we are on the last slides. So uh, uh, I would like to say thank you, uh, both in the name of Anne and, and me, uh, for your attention. Um, you have there our contact details uh, in case of uh, further questions. And our, if there are questions now, I would be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the nice presentation. So for the sake of, of time, uh, we will have the time now to take one question, if there is one. Uh, and don't forget that we will still allocate some minutes uh, at the end of the webinar for, for a more general question or if we didn't have the time to answer. So, so please do not hesitate to send a question if you have one. So there is one question, Peter. So except for PET bottles or HDPE bottles, do you know if there are other usage of recycled material in packaging? Um, <clears throat> in, uh, if if uh, it is used again as uh, food contact material, uh, in fact, no. So uh, the PET is, uh, or uh, I must say the recycled PET can be used again for food contact materials um for sure uh, if we look to the recycling uh, uh, pet as well as hdpe but also for example polypropylene is already recycled but for example the recycled polypropylene will not go again to for food contact material applications and this will go to other uh, applications like in construction or automotive or, or other sectors so in fact at this moment it's only our pet that is used again for food contact material Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So we will now move on to the third speaker and we go back, uh, we will have some time for other questions at the end. So uh, no other poll this time before the presentation. I give directly the floor to uh, Thomas Buda. Yes, hello everybody. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to talk to you now. It's now not anymore the full scientific session. It's now the part a little bit to tell you why we doing those kind of webinars and what kind of other activities are ongoing in the ILSI world and especially in the packaging uh, material world. As uh, Lucy in the beginning addressed to you, ILSI, the organization, uh, it's clear, so I will not repeat it here, but within this organization, we have a, a task force uh, which is dealing with packaging materials. Currently, I'm chairing this group and I would tell you a little bit about this group. It's a little bit like advertisement, not fully. But uh, you will see later that you can participate in, in several ways to uh, the activities of, of this uh, group. So first of all, what is the uh, task force objective? Before I tell you who is a member, I will tell you what we are doing currently and what is the main focus. And there is a shift in focus. And that's the reason of, of this webinar as well. On one hand, and that's a classical way, and that's for any kind of packaging material still valid is that food contact materials have to be safe. 
you know, there's a huge legislation in the background, not only in Europe, even in, in the US and China, but for all uh, the, the goal is the same, it has to be safe, but the rules, how to demonstrate safety, not in any way absolutely clear, as legislations provides some gaps. And here we discuss a little bit about these topics, I will come back to that. Then the second point, and this is a switch to the uh, two speakers before, is what is the environmental impact? Sustainability is uh, one, on one hand a topic here, that's also clear. But on the other hand, how consumers uh, aware, have the awareness on packaging, we, he we heard it already. So this is also a topic we like to discuss. Then the third point is definitely to follow new improvements, even on technolo technological side, but even on analytical testing side, and much more important at the end, to assess, to assess the safety, what kind of risk assessments can be done, what is the way of risk assessments, I show you examples. And for sure, uh, food packaging becoming more and more uh, interest in the public. We heard it already, the waste problem is always linked to packaging. There are also a lot of advantages, maybe that's not in the focus, this can be highlighted. But uh, the group or the task force is just uh, covering also this kind of topics. To give you a short impression on what is the strategy of this group, when you look at this slide, you see on the left-hand side, maybe you can read it. So I put it as one of these uh, outputs. It's so-called educative material where we discuss in our task force about hot topics. You see one of these burning topics and still ongoing is uh, the story about the NIAS, the non-intentionally added substances. We published here as a task force, a so-called black and white book. It's freely downloadable from the LC homepage. Um, which is summarizing the current knowledge about NIAS and uh, the way how to assess. It's not fully conclusive, for sure, you know, those people dealing with NIAS know that they're always showing up new signals and you have to find a way as a company how to solve the problem of this uh, kind of NIAS. In this series of black and white books, there are many, many more black and white books available. So on materials, like the most recent one is dealing with adhesive. So it's worthwhile to look it in, especially for newcomers and or sometimes also for those guys who are for a long time in that business. Then we see in the middle the literature review. So we have still activities and I here picked up one of the more recent one. It's published in 2016. It's about nanotechnology for food packaging. It's also a topic discussed. We also did here certain workshops, no, not certain, one workshop, and then a lot of pre-discussion and afterwards discussions. And this is a summary on ongoing activities, on ongoing knowledge in, in the world of nanotechnology linked to food packaging. Also one of those strategies to be uh, in the focus to have the most recent information on those kind of topics. And maybe on the right side of this slide, you see also that's uh, not webinars. Webinars now the form in this modern times dealing with uh, viruses before and afterwards, hopefully we'll come back to that, that's um, workshops or even symposia. There's one, the mineral oil uh, workshop from uh, February uh, 2019. I will come back to that in detail and you'll be aware about the symposium, which typically took place every four years. It should have taken place in November this year, but we see it's postponed. I will come back to that as well. So now, who are the members of those task force? You see, currently we have 11 industry members and that uh, the idea of ILSI, that not only industries there, we have still uh, so-called scientific advisors. We have one for analytical, a job that's currently Thomas Siemert from the Technical University of Dresden and then we have one representative from a governmental agency that's from the Swiss uh, um, uh, agent, current, uh, agency here, that's uh, Roger Mövli. He's now retired but still in that part, maybe he was one of the guys responsible for the printing ink regulation in Switzerland. We had in between a third advisor which was, he was dealing more with toxicological aspects uh, this is now a you know, vacancy and we look what we can fill up here. Those companies you see on the right side, I will not go through one by one and will not give you the name, but uh, you may know these companies very well and you know some uh, 
representatives of that. You see currently 11, so the average membership is between 10 and 16. Now we are currently at 11. That's a good size uh, of dealing with these topics. So just going into more detail, what are the current activities? Maybe you will hear about it, will read about it, even in this year. There's on the left uh, top corner, the mineral oil issue. I mentioned it already. We had this workshop, mineral oil issues, uh, still also a hot topic. There are huge discussions. Is it now safe? Is it more dangerous? Uh, where we can find uh, mineral oils? We had this workshop. I will come back to that on the next slide. Then we have a current activity that's called best practices for unknown migrants from food contact materials. Now it's an um, expert group where we want to highlight how to analyze food contact materials beside what is given in the legislation. Everybody is aware about this plastic regulation, but if you transfer to other materials, non-plastic, then many, many stakeholders struggle and we try to find here a guideline for best practices. The symposium on the left uh, bottom corner I already mentioned, uh, that's clear. Every four years, it's a highly scientific uh, uh, symposia where we're dealing with the most uh, interesting topics. I will show you as well later. And for sure, there are new developments. One we heard already from the two uh, previous speakers about sustainability, the link between sustainable material, but even sustainable material must be safe and how we want to do that. Maybe that will be one of our next new expert group activities as well. So coming back to this mineral oil uh, issue and the workshop, you, um, you see in the next slide that we have started in 2019. We are just close before end to summarize not only the presentations, uh, these workshops we typically organize in that way is by invitation. We had a group, I guess it was around 50 people and discussed uh, some topics, not only here related to food, it was also for cosmetics, it was also uh, for other areas where mineral oils could be present, it's packaging, it's food, it's cosmetics, that's clear. And uh, the aim of the workshop was to identify on one hand, what is the current knowledge and that's more important, where are the gaps? And the gaps are ob obvious, we have a gap in assessing the risk of mineral oils. Besides that, there's still a gap in the analytical uh, chemistry. You know that there's always some publications, some laboratories report huge amounts of findings, other report very low amount of findings. And then uh, is it now a uh, mineral oil? How we deal with those mineral oils which are mentioned in legislations and allowed, how we can differentiate from, let's say, the bad mineral oils, crude oils. So this is uh, was discussed. And now in this small group, we are writing the summary and I can show you the timeline a little bit. It is um, the uh, finalization is foreseen if everything runs well for August this year that we can um, provide to an editor and then it, uh, the publication can be done. We are more or less finished with our work and I hope if everything runs really smoothly that we may have uh, in the third, fourth quarter of this year, a final publication. So we are really on track and you see here also as well as workshop participants, 50 was well, uh, very well estimated. We had 29 uh, participants from industry, 15 from academics. That's a typical uh, ratio, what we typically uh, try to get and then some uh, non-industry organization and even some uh, uh, governmental and institution. So I guess I told you everything about this you can expect there will be that's a good timing i guess because currently there are also some uh, activities ongoing on the joint research center in ispra on baby food on infant food, formula food to align on analytical and everybody is awaiting some more opinion from efsa and we can fill this gap where we already summarize those results the new activities are also clear. I mentioned it, best practice. What is, uh, it's a follow-up of our NIAS activity. I showed you the black and white book. Here we addressed uh, certain gaps as well on the analytical chemistry, as well on the assessment part. Now we try 
to fill as much as currently possible. Here, the analytical part. What would be a best practice if you want to run NIAS studies? What should you consider? What is feasible? And moreover, what is currently not feasible? Where are the uh, shortenings or respectively where are the showstopper? That means when you deal what what you can do when you have too many unknown substances. This is still um, fully clear. We need some more guidance. And moreover, as already said, we need more guidance here uh, for for those materials which are non-plastic. In the bottom, you see a little bit the timeline. We started uh, more or less one year ago. For our, in our opinion, we are really good on track. We intended to do the workshop in November. This is not correct. We will postpone as well. We might to link it with the symposia in February 2021, and then we. Uh, will take up this in this discussion points the uh, the contra the cost the pros and cons from the workshop discussion also into a publication which way ever and then share with you as a group as public available document last but not least is definitely the uh, the key event in the food packaging material, which is organized by this task force. We are just in between. We are a little bit uh, stopped by this virus event. You see it's postponed. Um, you see also, we, now we found a new date. that will be in February 2021. So that means we have to have a deviation from the typical every four years uh, timeline. Now we have to go for five years, but maybe we see what will be the next. Oops, I was too quick, sorry. The scientific program is, has also been addressed and announced. So definitely we will dealing with analytical techniques, uh, what's coming new, what, what can be applied to uh, packaging. There's definitely the non-target screening is uh, definitely a topic. Then for sure, the toxicological prediction, I guess most of you are aware about this tox tree systems and similar programs and even what kind of other tools we have in hand. And finally, how do you do the assessment? What's new here? Then for sure, the general risk assessment, we expect uh, the most uh, recent insights, what can be done. And that's now the link between the previous talks, what's coming next with the circular economy, sustainability, new functionality, new packaging, uh, with, with in light with the new strategy of the EU to reduce waste, especially on plastic, that's definitely should be covered in that meeting. And uh, most of you, I guess, have already participated in the previous meetings. So uh, for the new activity, only just one slide. I addressed it already briefly is, and you see on the left side, what, what is the intention, the functionality of packaging. We want to have an ex extended um, shelf life of food expressed very well before, but this, how we can achieve it, what kind of materials are needed. And for sure in food packaging, we always have an issue on the economics, on the price. You know, packaging should not cost too much, mainly as low as possible, but uh, who is willing to invest money into your new, new packaging if it's more expensive as the classical one? This is a balance we have to find. And expressed by Peter already is about the sustainable issue, what we're doing with the new materials, maybe plant-based materials with new ingredients, especially if you think about on NIAS, how we deal with those new substances which are not addressed in any, addressed in any database from an analytical point of view, how you want to deal with that. And then again, on the right side of this slide, we have definitely to show what is the safety impact and everything starts here again with migration. And uh, we have definitely in this slide risk for consumers. If you're dealing with new materials, new substances, if you have a lack of knowledge, this should be tackled. And of course, there's a risk for producers. What happens if you invest a lot of money and at the end you see, we see something we cannot solve. And then the bottom line of the right side uh, part of the slide, you see also in the assessment, there is a shift. We do not see any human in the same way. We have to differentiate more and more. We have food more or less for infants. We have food for elderly people. So how we assess this, the body weight expression of limits, 
might becoming more and more aware and this also has an influence on the activities. These are some, um, some views on what we discuss in our task force. The task force is typically organized that we have uh, our daily business, we discuss on the ongoing activities, having reports and typically in the afternoon of our meetings when we are physically present, we have a so-called scientific uh, part where we invite uh, experts to uh, demonstrate and to highlight what's coming new. And from that, typically we discuss what could be a new expert group within our task force, within the ILC world. And then we're dealing in the same way as we currently do with the mineral oil and even with the best practice guidance group. This gives you a brief overview on our activities, what we are doing, and if some of you is interested to join, you can join for sure, you can get the feeling if once we're coming back physically, um, otherwise you have to join those kind of um, webinars, which we are now going to start a little bit to, 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 to make visible what are the activities. With this small words, I would stop here and hand over to Lucy again to raise, to answer, to deal, to monitor, question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the presentation. So yeah, we still have, uh, so we have five minutes left for the general question. So I have, we have received a batch of questions, so I'm going to pick some. And please be uh, know all that we will keep all the questions and refer them to the speaker. So if we are not, we don't have the time to answer all of them here, which will probably be the case, we will refer to the to the different speakers and they may build on answers uh, later on. So I have first the questions for Peter. So Peter, you mentioned we already have 55% recycled packaging in 2015. Does this concern all the packaging materials and not only plastics and not only food packaging? Uh, no, I, I think the the, the, the target is uh, 55% by 2025. So at this in in 2015 we had about 40%. Uh, this is um, if I'm not mistaken, this is all plastic packaging. So not only uh, food packaging, but plastic packaging in general. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, then I. I have a question for Anne. Uh, Anne, which would be for you the balance between food loss and functionality? That might be a bold uh, question. Yeah, it's a, a, a little bit a weird, a strange question. I don't really know what we are aiming for. I think food losses should be reduced anyhow as much as possible um and and we, we should try that to to put extra effort in functionality and i think it's especially important that we we put a message to the consumer that the food packaging is not waste and that it really has a purpose and i think that message should be brought to the public that they see it not only as a waste because they forget what was in there and how it protected it to food and we should maybe clarify that more to the consumer. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, yeah, another question then for Peter. Um, what will be the main focus in recycling processes for the coming years? Further expansion of mechanical recycling or putting more, putting more focus on chemical recycling? Yeah, well, that... Um for sure these are two complementary techniques so it's not that the one is a competitor of the other one is so we will both have mechanical and chemical recycling in the future and uh, it is foreseen that chemical recycling will be used for those streams which are very difficult in mechanical recycling so mm -hmm. we think that chemical uh, mechanical recycling will be still the major technique that will be used in future but chemical recycling will advance, especially for those material streams which are very difficult to mechanically recycle. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so we only have two minutes left and after that the webinar will cut. So uh, I, there are other, other very interesting questions that came in. So I reassure the participants that these questions will be redirected to the speakers and they will come back to you with an answer. 
Um, so you see that there is a poll now online. Uh, we would be very uh, grateful if you could just take a few seconds to answer this poll before leaving the webinar. And with this, I would like to thank you very much the three speakers again for their time today and for the very nice presentation. And of course, thank you to all participants uh, for their attendance. Enjoy the rest of the day.